So uh, hi everyone and welcome to our AMA or Ask Me Anything. We are super excited to be here today. Um, you have the opportunity to ask our experts anything about publishing, monetization, creatives, game design, you name it. In a live Q&A session, uh, I'm Samantha Benjamin, Director of Growth at Supersonic, and with me we have Yaniv Arouati, Senior Publishing Product Manager, uh, Shai Laufgas, Game Designer, and finally, Jaco Maraliulo, Creative Lead. I'm a fox. <laughs> So we'll answer the questions we got to have, uh, we got ahead of time, plus the ones we're getting during this live session. So make sure to pop your questions in the Q&A field or chat to get them answered. So let's get started. Uh, we'll start from the beginning. And if I think you can take this one, the question is, where can I find game inspiration? And in your experience, which game mechanics do you see often in successful hyper-casual games? Uh, cool. So first of all, hi, everyone. Um, so inspiration is always uh, um, the most interesting thing and, and basically the beginning of every game that we develop. Um, I think the two main uh, um, areas where I can find, where I recommend you to find inspiration, first of all, is the top charts, okay? Uh, we, we're not inventing it the, with the wheel over here. We're not trying to, to do uh, something very out of the box, but we can see what is working we can see what are the games that are successful for a long time, uh, um, and I'm talking about years, uh, uh, but also what are now trending in the top uh, charts. Seeing those type of games, seeing uh, uh, the themes that are working, what are the themes that are um, generating a lot of installs, generating low CPI and high marketability, uh, but also what are the mechanics that are working. So you don't need to invent anything new. Of course, innovation is always good, but 80% of the games are just using you know, uh, um, a combination of few different things from other games. So look over there, see what is working and, and try to combine it uh, um, into your own idea. Um, another thing that is always good and, and in this day and age, it's always uh, uh, important to say it is AI. Um, you can use any of those uh, uh, chat GPT or any AI or gen AI tools to, to kind of ideate about ideas. You can give uh, uh, some uh, uh, inspiration, some a prompt regarding what are you looking for, and the tool will already generate you a lot of ideas, so you can use this uh, both for ideation, for themes, and for um, unique mechanics. Thank you, Yaniv. So now that we got to learn about which game mechanics are interesting, what we should be focusing on, um, let's try to connect it to a question I see here. I think Shai can help us with it. Um, how should I build my levels for a color by, ne by number game? Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, hi everyone, and um, uh, I think that this question relates also to a trend that we see with lots of uh, uh, puzzle games, which are currently trending, sorting games, uh, the different game games, uh, game games. Sorry, that we see. Um, I think we need to um, just start simple, right? Like we need to make sure that uh, we start with some basic levels, and we gradually introduce players with. Uh, new mechanics, uh, new elements uh, uh, on the gameplay. Um, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we also don't overwhelm players with like uh, very quick and fast start. Uh, so we need to make sure for in this example that, um, you know, that the level uh, doesn't have like tiny sections and we don't repeat like um, the same color over and over again to avoid um, those boring moments. Um, another thing that can help, I guess, um, try to use themes that you know that work. It could be animals, it could be different places around the world, it could be fruits and so on and so on. Um, make sure that, um, you know, like, especially when, when we're talking about puzzle games, which um, evolves about color, that uh, you use appropriate uh, color palette. Right, so uh, make sure that it looks nice and it fits to what uh, you're actually drawing. Um, and last thing I think is just try to use, like always, uh, as many references as you can to find like cool elements that could fit your gameplay. Um, yeah, and just make sure that um, you take it slow. Um, you know, you 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 build your game with some. Um, hard levels and relief moments, 
And I think it should be good to go. Amazing. Um, thank you very much, Shai. That was uh, super insightful. Um, so now that we learned some tips on how to build our color by number game, I want to ask our expert on creatives, Jaco, the great, the following question. How do I make sure that my game's unique features are highlighted in the creative and which type of creatives are more effective? Actual gameplay, fake gameplay, ASMR followed by gameplay. Jaco, give us uh, your insight. Yeah, so first of all, thanks, Sam. I think this is a very nice question that actually touching on a few uh, important points. Um, I see the creative as, a, as an opportunity to really showcase your game uh, best attributes, right? And once you know what these are, um, the next step is to really know how to bring them forward, right? And considering this highly competitive marketplace where we're working in, and of course, um, the attention, the short attention span of our users, you really don't want to miss the shot. Uh, so this is exactly what we're suggesting always as a first approach to really start with a bang, right? You want to start with the most exciting uh, part of your game already from the start. So I think also it's important here to distinguish to differentiate uh, what can really, between the creative approaches that can eventually uh, help you reduce your CPI during early and advanced stages, like for example, choosing the right level and showing the most effective way of playing that specific levels, from those that eventually can drive uh, incremental growth and scalability on the next phases. So um, in general, I think that um, the creative should focus on readability. This is why exactly we're suggesting, right, to start with simpler characters and environment, because this is eventually what can help really drastically drop the CPI without affecting other in-game mechanics, right? Uh, the scope here is always, I think, clarity, because clarity is exactly uh, absolutely still key of having a good CPI. Users really need to understand uh, the mechanics, the goals, and the controls of your game very, very easily. And when your game is really clear and straightforward, it really becomes automatically more accessible and engaging with a wider audience. This is why I think the um, actual uh, uh, gameplay recordings <clears throat> uh, provides, I think, the most accurate representation of your game experience because they are teaching the viewers uh, how to play the game, right? The mechanics and its dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I think still this is the most effective really way of reducing your CPI, getting really focused on the levels and how you play those levels. Coming back to the other part of the question, I think still fake gameplay and ASMR video, this is definitely one of the top trends in the industry for a few years, and we know that. But considering fake gameplay, I think, of course, uh, they can generate definitely an initial interest, right, in the audience, uh, but they can potentially lead to uh, disappointment, right? If the actual gameplay really doesn't match the expectation promise in the advertising, as well as the ASMR videos, uh, I think this is a very good trick to engage the user with um, these sensory experiences, but also the efficacy here can be limited if we're not showcasing effectively the core gameplay mechanics. So my two cents and suggestions here are going uh, to always keep your creative concise and attention grabbing and quickly explain uh, why, uh, what makes your game appealing, right? So try to always highlight your core uh, gameplay mechanics, your visuals, the features that can really differentiate you from the other games in the genre. Amazing. It's like actually very true. I know coming from the growth side that not always the misleading creatives are bringing the best in terms of uh, posting stall events. We see sometimes very low metrics uh, from such creatives, and it could be mainly because it's not really representing the gameplay and the experience the users get, and they feel like frustrated, uh, at least some of them. So uh, I can definitely relate to what you're saying. And I'll connect this to a question that I can answer myself. It is, how can I boost my game's exposure 
And I think that's a great question. In, in my opinion, there is not one simple answer. When looking at hyper casual games, marketability is everything. <laughs> Like you want to be able to buy with low CPIs to reach a very large audience of users. And that's key to success in the long term. And uh, supersonic growth and creative teams, which are filled with like very senior experts from the industry, are always investing on making sure we are maximizing the game exposure through very sophisticated user acquisition across multiple UA channels making data-driven optimizations and always exploring innovative ways to boost our campaigns. Um, I think that the key to growth is not only data-driven, but also creative-driven, and it goes hand by hand. And investing a lot, like we are investing a lot in creative productions, producing tons of videos, playables, interactive ads. And one of the, the tips that we can say is following the trends on social media can really help boosting your organic awareness, making your video goes viral. And um, I think one more thing that can help as well is doing app store optimizations. We've seen many cases where, you know, A-B testing icons and applying the winning icon to the store can help us boost campaigns uh, significantly, keep the same cost per install, but increase the spend quite a lot. Uh, and that's just from updating an icon. It can especially impact on uh, Google, of course, on Android. And um, I think one of the major benefits to increasing the game exposure, especially for Supersonic, is the fact that we have so many apps. And uh, we are also very focused on cross-promotion campaigns, bringing users from a game to another and making sure we are maximizing the reach across all of our apps. Um, so... To wrap it up now, since we talked so much about marketability and the importance of, uh, you know, boosting your game um, exposure, I think I'll have a follow-up question for Yaniv that can help uh, those that are wondering the opposite scenario. Yaniv, so what happens to a game with low marketability score, but high potential in average playtime per user and retention? Um, that's a great question, and um, we're actually seeing that a lot nowadays with the shift of the market that uh, many of the games became, become uh, uh, deeper and uh, hybrid, you can call them, um, where the marketability is not as strong as it used to be, but the playtime and the retention um, are very, very high. So again, it's always a balance of those two. Um, at the end of the day, we are in the business of making games that are profitable. We want to make money. And if we won't be able to be profitable on the users that we purchase, um, we have nothing to do. So it's always to balance. If I have uh, um, a game with, that starts with a CPI of, I don't know, $1, then um, it needs to have a very, very high and, and late uh, in-game metrics. I'm talking about retention day seven of you know 15%, something like that. This is a, it means that the game is sticky. The users are keeping on playing. They're playing over and over and over, not just retention. Also, uh, uh, APPU, average playtime per user, or just playtime. We want to see uh, a few thousands of, of seconds every day being added by the players. And then if we can uh, uh, say, okay, um, the marketability score is low. The CPI now at the early stages is $1. Scaling the game later on, it's probably going to reach $2.5 or something like that. But if we have that um, late in-game metric that we will, and, and if we will be able to translate it later on to RV engagement to IAP, then we might be able to get an LTV higher than that, which $3. And then whenever we are at the point where the LTV is higher than uh, the average CPI or, or, or uh, IPM or CPM that we are buying, then um, we are in a profitable level and we can scale. So uh, to, to sum it up, there is no a specific API that I can tell you, oh, this CPI is good and this CPI is not. It's always a balance. What does the game offer and where we can uh, uh, um, scale it on later on. Amazing, yeah. thank you so much. Um, I can say also from the growth side that uh, having like a low marketability sometimes is hard and we need to like try and focus on building games that can reach like a variety of uh, players and a vast audience, even if the CPIs are you know, higher than what we are used to, because in the end, if we are very limited to a niche amount of users that we can buy, it can make the game very challenging, even with the very high LTV. So it needs to be a balance of both, um, but very interesting insights. Thank yeah. you, Yaniv. 
And um, I'll give you um, another question before I let you rest for a sure. little bit. <laughs> no so if you can tell us how a game proceeds to the iteration phase despite a low marketability in Supersonic. Um, so it's it's very it's very much connected to to what I said. We want to reach those um, uh, high KPIs at the beginning, but um, the, the in-game KPIs, but also to not you know uh, uh, have too high of a CPI. So if a, if a game starts with two plus uh, a dollar CPI, it it probably won't reach um, the the iteration unless from the beginning we're talking about some hybrid. Uh, uh, super you know late casual or hybrid casual game but most of the games that we are working with um we, we need to have some sort of a good marketability uh, um at the beginning um and then we are analyzing um later on what is the the the, the late in-game metrics we're waiting for the test and the user to mature to see what are the numbers we see on day seven and even what we see on day 30 and of course to combine with that, we're not want we don't want to trust only on Facebook. So we're running marketability tests across other channels. We're running them on Google, on Unity, uh, um, on Iron Source, on, on all of the platform to try and understand how is the marketability across multiple challenge uh, channels. And then we are um, gathering together what we call the market, a marketability score. And if the marketability score is okay, together with good in-game metrics, then um, we're moving forward into iteration. Great. So either very good marketability score or like a balance, you know, balance. A balance or a balance of in very game. good in game. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, makes sense. So um Jacko and maybe also Yaniv, I think both of you can take. We'll start with Jacko, our creative master. How should we how should I focus? No, sorry, I'll rephrase it. Should I focus on making a lot of creatives to get low CPI? or spend more time on the game to get higher playtime and retention? That's another sweet question, I think. Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, the games should be confronted to the market ASP, try to avoid this over-investing, right? Because the goal of the prototypes eventually is to be tested, to fail cheap and to fail fast, either to really let your idea go or understand and know where to iterate and keep building. So I believe that the, balancing right the creative production and the games development i think here is crucial while of course having uh new creatives can always help optimize um your cpi over time of course neglecting game development to just focus on creative production might result in a weak game experience right and this is exactly i think it's essential here to strike this balance between creating effective creative materials and ensuring that there is an, a very engaging game experience that uh, needs to retain players over time. I think uh, this is a, a must, right? We, we need, really need to be able to balance that. Mm -hmm. You have anything? To yeah, um, I'll, I'll add to, to what Jaco said. Also, um, relating to what you mentioned um, earlier, we want the creatives to be, at least at the early stage, to be very reliable. To, to just show what is the gameplay. And that's why on the first test, we only test between four to six uh, uh, creatives. And and we uh, we ask the, the developers to not do any tricks and any uh, fake uh, uh, addition to the creative. So they can just record a regular gameplay. Of course, we should have some sort of script, you know, a lose, a fail, uh, an epic fail, a great success, all of those uh, um, scenarios that are, are building interest in the player. But that's it. And then we are testing the game. So especially if we are talking about, if we're talking about hyper casual games, then we're talking about low CPI, no problem. We're getting the 30 cents. It, it's not crucial if we have now 40% uh, day one on the first test, right? But if we are testing a game that we know the mechanic is not the most uh, um, marketable, and we know we are aiming for those games that are a little bit higher on marketability on CPI, but also higher on in-game, then it's much better to invest in, in the uh, core gameplay and having more levels. So even on the first test, we're gonna see $1, but we're gonna see this 40% day one, and we're gonna say, okay, we can work with it. Because if we're gonna see $1 with uh, 400 uh, seconds uh, playtime and 15% and day one retention, we won't gonna work on it, we're not gonna iterate on it. So it's, again, like Jaco said, a balance of 
of taking uh, the best use of your time to both test the game as, as fast as possible, uh, uh, but also have enough uh, in-game uh, content. Makes sense. Great, great tips. Thank you, guys. Um, so now we'll try to focus a little bit more on how we actually can build good uh, prototypes and great games. And uh, I'm going to go into some of the game design questions. Um, Shai, I'll give you two at once since you were quiet for a while. <laughs> yeah, sure. And um, let's see. So how can I effectively map out the progression of my game? And how can I effectively use sound design in my game? Yeah. Um, so progression obviously is a major key um, when we all play games, right? Like we want to we, we wanna feel that we go somewhere. Um, I think we sh you should always remember that you should start with a really good core gameplay because that's what moves the chain eventually. And that's like the most basic part of player progression when, when you play the game. So, you know, you present players the most basic controls and mechanics, and then um, you just keep uh, uh, expanding those areas as the uh, game keeps on going. Remember that uh, after you uh, made a tutorial or the players understand how to play the game, just make it um, a bit more complex and let players feel that they uh, use what they've learned so far. So this is also a great sense of accomplishment uh, uh, with the game. And don't forget to celebrate uh, um, uh, milestones in your game whenever players reach to whatever it could be, right? It could be like a boss battle and they get rewards and so on and so on. Um, another thing is that, you know, you need to, I guess, speak with uh, with people around you, you know, colleagues, uh, family members, uh, uh, friends, just ask how they feel, right, about the progression of the game. Uh, and back it up with data. Um, make sure that you look at the data, you see level drops, you can uh, play the game your, yourselves, obviously, and make sure that um, if you see something problematic, you know, just make sure if um, maybe it's uh, uh, too difficult or maybe it's not a difficult issue, maybe it's just something that, uh, um, you know, maybe unclarity of some sort, right, that you can uh, uh, fix. Um, and I would say, um, I think that's the most of it, I would say. Um, the last thing I would say when it comes to progression, just try to to document everything you, uh, that you do. So you would have a, an, a, a, an overview uh, of the progression of the game that you've made so far. And I think uh, it will it will help uh, uh, out to you and I guess players uh, will just enjoy the game uh, much better if you understand how it goes. Uh, so that's about the uh, progression. And the other question was about the sound, right? Yes. About uh, sound design. So here it's, I think we all agree that um, um, once we add music and sound effects to the game, it adds a lot. Um, we need to remember um, that we need to fit, right? Like the sound effects and the and music if we have um, to the game, right? If it's more of a zen, chill game, we're not gonna put some upbeat music, right? We're not gonna stress players unnecessarily. Um, also, we need to make sure that, you know, like uh, we use different cues for players so they understand if they did something good or something bad, uh, if they manage to um, unlock if they won, if they lost, all of that, it should be uh, taken into account when designing the sound of the game. Um, we know um, that in most cases on, on the test that we do, we do know that sound uh, and music or sound effects, um, they do end up with like better KPIs for the game. So, you know, as far as I see it, um, just make sure that you understand the game, right? Like the sound is kind of the invisible language of your game. So make sure that you implement it properly um, and it fits the game. And, and, and I think everything else will come, uh, uh, you know, as good as it gets. Amazing. I, I remember also a case even after a game was already published on the product monetization side that we A-B tested the sound effects and we saw an uplift of around 15% to yeah. the ARPU day seven, just from adding the sound effects and optimizing around it. So I do think it's like a, something that it's a relatively simple, but a very important uh, Yeah, it's, it, it, it's sometimes uh, some developers I see that miss it, but as you said, like I can barely remember a test that we did with sound that failed. So yeah, uh, just that sound. I think I just want to add something here because you, you, 
Shai touched an important point. Um, especially for creatives, what we're seeing a lot that you're trying, of course, to have your soundtrack behind your creatives. Um, these should feel uh, a, a seamless experience, right? Exactly as Shai mentioned before, we need to make sure that you apply the right soundtrack for the right motivators. Because, of course, if we're talking about a specific audience that just want to uh, unwind, right, for a very hard day and just want to relax, having an upbeat music probably won't be that effective. So <laughs> you need to make sure, of course, to match the motivation of the video with the specific soundtrack and sound effects. Great addition. Um, great, Shai. So since you're on fire and sharing so much knowledge with everyone, I will give you another question. Sure. <laughs> Um, how can I use player feedback to adjust difficulty levels? Can you even do that? Uh, yeah, so I touched it earlier a bit, right? So you need to make sure um, that you just keep getting like feedback from players directly or indirectly. Uh, you can use play testers. You can use even like check the, the sometimes you can check the, the reviews on your store as a feedback. It's a great feedback. Uh, you can check social media and so on and so on. Um, and, and, make sure that while you care about those opinions to back up everything as much as you can uh, with data. And with that, I think it's really important to add uh, in-game design events, I would say, in your code um, to important gameplay moments where you can definitely measure, right? Like not everything is measurable, but whatever you can measure, uh, I, you should. Um, and I think that's something that personally I see that uh, developers sometimes they keep on missing and I think it's important and this is why we re we remind them that we need more data and, and more events um, and um, another thing that you can do in terms of difficulty is to make sure that you offer um, another option for more skilled players if we're talking um, what I mentioned earlier right about like puzzle games which are currently trending so you could take a level and offer for skilled players to repeat maybe the same level with a new layer of challenge. It could be a time limit, right? So maybe you need to play the same level again. You would get like a better reward, um, but just play it on a, with a time limit. Um, so that's another way to address difficulty and try to adjust it to different types of, uh, of players. Um, and just keep monitoring. Just keep monitoring your game on a daily basis. See how, see the different, uh, um, you know, like the level start complete ratio. Look at the fails. Uh, look at significant drops and try to understand why. And obviously keep playing your game and let others play your game. Uh, and just get this 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 feed of information and 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 try to and and don't be afraid to. To adjust and to be flexible to change uh, certain things, um, yeah. And I think um, that would cover, uh, I guess, uh, what is on my mind uh, when it comes to some difficult great thing. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. Basically, it's a must. Yeah, player feedback uh, is crucial. To making sure you're building the right game. Yeah, eventually, work. also you did like you need to um, appreciate the feedback and make sure that you address it. Players will appreciate it, right? Like if you get a feedback of something that maybe is too hard, too boring, maybe something is missing. Just be open to to listen to this feedback and just apply it. Um, and eventually, players will will appreciate it. Something important again, uh, also about the custom events, it's a trick that we're actually using also, uh, you know, in, in interactive ads when we're building playbooks, right? We're setting custom events to really understand what the user journey looks like if they're getting engaged from the tutorial up until the end of the game. So I think definitely this is a, a great ad that you should consider while you're developing your game. Right. Data is everything. Yeah, <laughs> as a better idea. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go with your feeling, go with the numbers. Yes. Um, great, so thank you, Shai. Okay. I'll let you uh, take a rest a little bit. Some you water you like. so, much, <laughs> so much knowledge. Um, Yaniv, I think you can take this one. Uh, I have a game with good metrics, but there are many similar ones in the store. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Would you still be interested? Um. 
Um, there is no clear answer, right? I, I won't say no. It's not a clear Why? no. Um, I'm I'm interested in all games. Okay, there are many similar games out there. It's all about how similar it is. If it's a complete copy, then no, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't want to copy games that other uh, um, developers did or publisher published. Um, but if it's a twist, it's a mechanic that you see that is working for a game in the top charts, and you did it with a different theme. That's completely fine. If you did, uh, um, uh, like you took the mechanic and you changed the objects and you changed uh, uh, something in the gameplay, there is always um, an option to change something to be different enough. So it's a thin line and we need to work on it together. Uh, but once you look at the game, you can always try and think, okay, this part is too similar. How can I change it to not be similar? So if if these are the, the uh, I'm using, um, there are many examples. If it's using blocks, let's use uh, 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 bricks. And if it's using uh, uh, um, characters, let's try and use animals. Like there are there are many things that you can change with with any type of gameplay. But at the end of the day, there are X amount of mechanics that working. Uh, uh, we saw that you know in the hyper casual world, since Supersonic started, there were like hundreds of runner games that made it to the top charts and made huge amount of profit. At the end of the day, all of the runners, they have the same mechanic. You move forward, you go through gates, something is visually changing and you collect things. But yet they are different because you use a different character, you use a different progression method, you use a, a, you're adding merge to it, you're adding a, a, a boss at the end. There are many things you can add and, vary, and, and change in order to make the, the variation a little bit um, wider. So again, don't go with something too similar. Already in the um, in the thoughts of of making the game in the ideation process, try to think. Okay, there is no problem. This game is my ideation. This is where I took the ideation. But uh, how do I make it different? But also, if you already have a game and you want to and you and you see good metrics, but it's too similar, we can always um, work out together how to differentiate it enough. Yeah, sure. that's it. I, I, I can also yeah. maybe add that uh, the questions that um, Yaniv just shared, I think it's important question. This is what makes the industry evolves in a way. Um, the tile match games that we've seen like uh, a couple of months ago or a year ago, like their next evolution were the, uh, actually are the gen games because it's based on the same kind of mechanic. You have a limited amount of slots. You need to push the tiles or whatever it is now and you add a, 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 a different puzzle layer on top of that, like the different gen games that we see on the top charts. And that's actually um, what Yaniv just said. It's it's like, how do I take the tile uh, matching game and I evolve it? And I think that's how we ended up with those gen games. So it's important. I think um, definitely creativity, uh, it's something that really plays a significant role here, right? Eventually the goal here is to differentiate your game from the market in the general. So uh, first of all, of course, always take a look at the top chart in terms of getting some art inspiration and creative inspiration. Uh, but for me personally, uh, I'm reaching the wow moment in creatives where I'm connecting the dots in between games, what I can bring from another game to my specific creative. So I think uh, uh, this is supposed to be the way of thinking, right? Exactly as Yaniv mentioned a few times, we're not inventing the wheel again here. You just need to be uh, smart to take exactly what is really working in the industry and trying to adapt to your creative concept. And this is exactly where good things are happening and you know you have more opportunity for your game to be successful thank you very much you guys um so before we close this up i saved the left the last uh, question for today's session for myself and i'll try to answer it uh, as briefly as i can although it's a very big question <laughs> um so the question is what changes in games occurred from 2020 to 2024 <laughs> Easy question. So, one or two changes. Yeah, one or two changes. We'll follow up on the next webinar. <laughs> so basically, it's a it's like too many years. Like so many changes happen. Even every couple of months, our industry is always always changing, evolving, um, knowing learning how to deal with new uh, regulations and new things that are coming. 
And I think that it's also what keeps it fun and interesting. There's no one, I think, in the mobile gaming that knows it all <laughs> because there's always something new coming up and that you have to learn and adapt to. Um, but if I have to summarize the last uh, three and a half years, I think that the first thing that comes to, I guess, anyone's mind is the huge global uh, pandemic that we all experience. Uh, this happened back in uh, 2020. And basically, in terms of uh, gaming, focused in hyper casual, it was a period of uh, actual growth. Like people had a lot of time, they were in quarantine, they were playing a lot, I guess, to pass through these uh, difficult times. And for the mobile gaming, we saw some like very nice uplift in the overall activity CPM, DAO, playtime, retention. And it was um, like a, a period of growth, if I would summarize it, but that's one of the first main changes. The second and third one happening in 2021. And it actually started with the privacy regulations of SKN network. And I think it was a huge shift, especially on user acquisition, on adapting and learning how to target your like your audience again, how to track the measurements of users that you're buying, how basically how to rebuild your whole user acquisition strategy in this new world of uh, privacy regulations. Um, and we took like this challenge as anything else we do as an opportunity and we try to be fast and smart and, you know, in supersonic, we build a lot of products around, um, all these new privacy regulations and how to handle it. Um, and basically the second change now that I don't see it here, but basically, um, I think in the last two years, if we're looking at hyper casual, one of the major, major uh, shifts that we're experiencing is the transition to deeper games, uh, more hybrid monetization models where you're monetizing from uh, ads and you're also monetizing from in-app purchases and trying to, to, to learn how to adapt our games to be much uh, deeper with better mechanics and longer retention and playtime and overall results. Uh, so this is still a trend that we are uh, in the early stages of and experiencing a lot in the hyper casual industry. Um, and I think that I'll wrap it up with that. Uh, but basically, if we look at the last four years, the better question would be what didn't change, right? Like everything is uh, changing constantly. And that's a wrap on our AMA questions sessions. And a huge thanks to all the supersonic experts for sharing their insights. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that our super spring contest ends in May 27. So be sure to submit uh, your runner simulation or puzzle games beforehand for even more insights and stay on top of our updates. You can follow on social media or visit our website. Right now we have some extra relevant resources to help you build a hit including three blogs that dive into all of the best practices of runner simulation and puzzles. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was awesome getting to hear and answer your questions, and I hope we all have a great weekend. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, guys.